Welcome back, everyone. We are to now the fourth and final part of our study in James. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I hope you've gotten a chance to work on not just learning what James says, but how do you find that? The whole goal of these studies isn't for me to just dump information on you. If you know information about the Bible, that's great, but what I really want for you is to be able to open the Bible and find that information yourself. So keep on working on the principles and practicing these each week. Well, this is a really exciting week because this is the whole point of what we're doing. We learn about the context. We want to make sure that we're learning about the original audience and how to do application and how to do all those things that help us understand the meaning. But the ultimate point is we want to understand how is Jesus part of this text. So session four is called Jesus in James. And I want to be specific in how we're saying we're going to find Jesus here. I'm not just going to do like a word search and circle the word Jesus every time I see it. It's not enough just to say, oh, well, they mention him, so that's enough. We very specifically want to see how James uses the Old Testament to prove that Jesus is who he says he is and the whole Bible makes sense because of that. James is going to use numerous Old Testament verses, and he's going to show us, now when we're living the Christian life because of Jesus, these prophecies about him, even these laws that were given in the Old Testament make sense, and we can live them out now because of who Jesus is and what he came to do. This graph here kind of shows us the point of how all of Scripture works. In the Old Testament, God revealed who He was. We saw that man became sinful and there was a problem. We could no longer be connected to God because He is perfect and He cannot be in the presence of our sin. So something had to happen to fix that. The entire Old Testament, we see the law, but no one can measure up to the law. The whole point of the law is not a whole bunch of rules you had to follow. It was a whole bunch of rules that proved you couldn't do it anyway, no matter how hard you tried. So all the law in the Old Testament shows us that what we need is a Savior, and everything prophesies the Savior. Why do I think that? Because Jesus thought that. On the road to Emmaus, He told those disciples about how the entire Old Testament the law and the history and the prophets were about him. So if Jesus says it's about him, we can trust him on that. See, the Old Testament flows there into the cross. Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, overcoming of sin, him accomplishing all of those prophecies and fulfilling everything is the center point of all of Scripture and the center point of what we understand in Christianity. Everything makes sense because of the cross. We go to the other side of this graph, and then we see the New Testament. So the Old Testament tells us who Jesus is going to be and why we need Him. Jesus comes, lives the perfect life, fulfills all the prophecies, is killed on the cross, and comes back to life and ascends to heaven. And then the Holy Spirit comes, and we live out in the New Testament life, and we can actually live what the law intended for us, because of Jesus. So we want to see how each author in the New Testament specifically tells us how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament and how we can look at these commands, some of the commands, some of the wisdom, some of the prophecies from the Old Testament, and how we can put those into application now because we know the whole story. So what I've got for you today is I have just a few verses where James makes an allusion or a reference to the Old Testament, and we're going to see how he uses that to explain to us something about the Christian life. Well, let's start out in the first chapter. Let's read James 1.11 here. James 1.11 says, For the sun rises, and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass. Its flower falls off, and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Now, this is in a section where James is talking about how believers who don't have much should boast 
because hey, they don't have a life to really dig into here. They're not going to get distracted by their possessions. They're not going to get distracted by their wealth. And he's giving a warning to believers who are very rich, saying, don't be distracted by temporary things. You need to focus on righteousness. You need to focus on repentance. You need to focus on who Jesus is. You can use that wealth to help other people know about Jesus. But don't get distracted by it because just like everything in this world, it's all going to fade away. And even us, we are going to fade away. How is this Old Testament? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a cheat sheet right here. You may not have noticed this or you may have just glanced over it, but that little column down the middle of your Bible where it has all those abbreviations, if you just look at the verse and then go over to that column where it references it, it'll tell you, hey, he's referring to the Old Testament here. You don't have to figure out every word in Greek and Hebrew and how it refers to the Old Testament. There are plenty of nerds in seminaries who will do that for you. I was one of those nerds for several years. They love doing this work. Let them write it in the Bible, and then you can use this as your cheat sheet to go back and see what the Old Testament is saying. Well, James 1.11 is specifically referring back to the withering of the grass in Psalm 102 and Isaiah 40. Let's take a look at those real quick and see how he's using these Old Testament passages to show us how our life in Jesus is different now. In Psalm 102, we start out with that definite illusion right there. My heart is suffering withered like grass. The writer of this psalm is using the same metaphor that James is. That's why it's an illusion. He's not saying, the psalmist says, he's just using the same language they are. This psalmist goes on and on about how it's difficult, about how he is depressed. Near the end of this psalm, he says, Because of your indignation and wrath, for you have picked me up and thrown me aside. My days are like a lengthening shadow, and I wither away like grass. James is talking about how the rich man can't be distracted because his days are slowly passing and he will wither like grass. The psalm is very specifically saying that this psalmist knows that he can't do anything to earn the favor of God. He can't do anything to earn the love of God. And he realizes that because of his sin, he has earned wrath. He knows that he needs a Savior because just like the rich man in James, he is withering like grass. James is making this reference to tell us because we have a Savior, we don't have to be fearful of withering like grass. We don't have to focus on wealth and possessions and temporary comfort because we have a Savior who can take care of this ultimate problem. You see, he's using the Old Testament and showing us through a lot of different ways, how Jesus fulfills that and what our Christian life should look like. But this is also a reference to Isaiah 40. This is a longer passage, but I want to go ahead and read it out because this one's a prophecy. Isaiah 40, a voice was saying, cry out. Another said, what should I cry out? All humanity is grass. See, it's using that same metaphor that James is using right there. And all its goodness is like the flower of the field. The grass wither, the flowers fade, when the breath of the Lord blows on them. Indeed, the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. Zion, herald of good news, go up on a high mountain. Jerusalem, herald of good news, raise your voice loudly. Raise it and do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with strength and his power establishes his rule. His wages are with him. His reward accompanies him. He protects the flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. So you see that James is using a lot of the same language. The grass and the flowers are fading, just like the rich person who is constantly looking at their possessions and thinking that that gives them meaning is fading. Just like all people, sadly, are slowly getting old, we are losing our health, and death is an eventuality for us all. James is talking about here, though, how in Isaiah, even in this condition, 
They said, we're well, a herald of good news because God is coming and bringing His kingdom. One of the other references he makes later in the book is that certain wealthy people have gone corrupt and they are withholding payment from their workers. People are working, they're trying to have dignity in their work and they're trying to do a good job, but they're not being paid for it. And then he says that Jesus, this coming ruler that's going to bring God's kingdom is not like that. His wages are with him and his reward accompanies him. Now, we know that Jesus is not coming to give you your day's wages. He's not coming to give you a paycheck. He is coming and faith in him is going to let us get out of our sin. He is going to pay the price even though we have sinned and the wages for that are death. He's going to take that away and give us His perfection so we can have eternal life. So in just a small, a small illusion, James is telling us, look at what the Old Testament said about Jesus. He is the one who can get us away from this depression. He is the one who says we won't have to work for wages that we'll never get. He is the one who is going to make everything okay and bring in a kingdom that is no longer corrupt. There is so much to the Old Testament, so many prophecies, so many things that we can see if we just take the time to go to this center column and then go look back, see what they had to say, look at the context in the Old Testament, look at it in our verses in the New Testament, and see how they connect. And as long as we remember the cross is in the middle and Jesus is what makes it all make sense, we'll be doing really good Bible reading. But we're only 11 verses in and he's already using the Old Testament. Let's go ahead and go to the next chapter, James 2 verse 1, and see how he can use this again. James 2 verse 1. He says, My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. So he is very specifically saying that if you show favoritism, you are giving Jesus a bad name. That part of living out your faith in Jesus is not showing favoritism. Is this just something that James made up? Is this just a thing? James really didn't like favoritism, so he's saying, well, I don't like that, so you shouldn't do it because of Jesus. Sometimes we can find something we like, one of our preferences, and just say, well, I think this should be Christian. What we need is we need to go back to the Bible, like we talked about in last week's episode, and see if the Bible backs that up or not. We need to have our preferences changed and defined by the Bible. So, James is not making this up. This isn't a preference of his. He is actually referring to laws in the Old Testament. In Leviticus chapter 15, I know you guys read Leviticus daily for your devotions. It's your favorite book. You love to go through and see every verse about how the goat's entrails should be spread in this way and you do this with the fat and this with the kidneys. But you'll have to forgive me. I have to read the Leviticus right here. Leviticus chapter 15. Do not act unjustly when deciding a case. Do not be partial to the poor or give the preference to the rich. Judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. So the law that was given in the Old Testament, when God was revealing himself and saying, Israel, if you want to be in my presence and do everything perfectly, these are the things that you would have to do. One of the specific commands that he gives them is when you are deciding a case like we would have a court case. This would be settling a dispute between two people. You cannot give preference to the poor. You cannot give preference to the rich. This could happen quite often, as we discussed last week in a church, that sometimes if an incredibly wealthy person might come in, we might say, hey, why don't you be our VIP so you can donate more to the church? Then a very poor person would come in and we would say, hey, can I sit in the back? But we can't go the opposite way either. I want to make very sure that we're seeing this. We're not supposed to have any favoritism. We can't say that we're only here to help the poor. People who are wealthy have sin as well. We want both of those people to come in, 
to our church and we want both of them to feel welcome. We want them to sit side by side and praise Jesus together. Just because it says don't prefer the rich doesn't mean that we automatically need to flip that and prefer that poor people come in, that we only show compassion to a certain type of person. The Bible is telling us that we need to love everyone equally in the same way. Now, we might have to help the poor and reach out to them and do missions in a certain way because they have more needs than someone wealthy does. But when they come into God's house, we want to love and welcome them in the same way. This also has a reference here in the same vein to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Moses is talking here, and that's very important to notice every time we talk about Moses and Jesus and how we're going to compare those things. So I took the leaders of your tribes, wise and respected men, and set them over you as leaders, commanders for thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, and officers for your tribe. I commanded your judges at that time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge rightly between a man and his brother or his resident alien. Do not show partiality when deciding a case. Listen to small and great alike. Do not be intimidated by anyone, for judgment belongs to God. Why is it important that this is Moses giving these people this command and then James is making reference to that? Well, Moses functioned in a very specific way. He was the prophet the leader of Israel who brought them out of slavery and then was going to God and arguing on their behalf. Moses is one of the few people that we see in the Bible that he pleads for the case of God's people and God actually relents from punishment. He spoke to God directly and then he took God's words and showed them to the people. So if Moses told them to do something, it was as if God himself was telling him to do something because Moses and God had a very special and specific relationship. That relationship in the Old Testament, everything about Moses was designed to show us something about Jesus. Now, if you want the fancy $5 theological seminary word for that, we call it a typology. You can now write that down and impress your friends and neighbors at parties. Moses would go to God, plead on behalf of the people, and then tell the people what God wanted them to do. James is making this illusion because he wants us to understand that Jesus came from God, that he is God and speaks directly to God, and he is the one who pleads on our behalf to God, and he is the one who tells us what God wants us to do. That's why he specifically says, don't show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Don't show partiality when deciding a case. Listen to small and great alike. We want to love everyone, and we want to be fair to everyone regardless of their influence, regardless of their nationality, regardless of who they are, and not be intimidated. We want to make sure that we are doing the right thing and showing fairness in every way because God is the one who tells us what's fair and not. We are just His messengers. So with a very simple command that James is using the Old Testament to back himself up, he is showing us this is one thing Moses said, but now we're acting on the command of Jesus. He's showing us how living the Christian life has always been shown in the Bible. It wasn't the law and then that, that didn't work, so they scrapped it and they said, well, I guess Jesus has to come now. Every law, every prophet was there to tell us something about who Jesus was about who he was going to be to those people in the Old Testament. They were looking out for him, they just didn't know his name. Now that we have the New Testament, we can look at the Old Testament, look at the New Testament, and see that he's the one who makes sense of everything. I know I'm repeating the same thing, but that's what the Bible does. Every chapter basically repeats, hey, Jesus is the one who makes all of this make sense. But we are definitely not done. James, in the later part of this chapter, actually makes some very direct references to the Old Testament. James chapter 2, again, verses 21 through 26. He's talking about how if you have faith, it needs to produce a change in your life. If you have faith, you 
better have works because your faith needs to be strong enough that it causes you to act. So James chapter 2, verses 21 through 26 say, Wasn't Abraham our fa father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works the faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works, not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. We're in James, and this is the section where he's saying, if your faith doesn't change you and make you do something, then it's probably not real faith. If I told you, oh, I don't know, let's say there was a vaccine uh, for a virus that was going to kill you, and if you got that vaccine, you'd stay alive. But you were like, eh, I just didn't go get it. Well, I would have to assume that you didn't actually believe me, because if you believed me, you would have done something about it. It's the same way with faith in Jesus. That's what James is saying. And he is making a direct reference to the Old Testament. He is actually quoting the Old Testament and showing how faith in what God said he was going to do has always been the way that he has worked with us. Very specifically, he talks about Abraham and Rahab. The quote that we have here, uh, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, very much sums up this idea of faith and how it applies to you. In Genesis 15, this is part of a story where God is showing Abraham his promise. So Genesis 15, he, that's God, took Abraham outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, Your offspring will be that numerous. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteous. Now, Abraham didn't do something great, and because he did some stuff, God said, All right, you can be righteous now. Abraham believed God, and it was that belief, that trust in God, that God valued and counted as the right thing. It also refers to when he was going to sacrifice Isaac. The Bible very specifically says that Abraham was willing to do that because he knew that God could raise him from the dead anyway. It wasn't the act of pulling his hand up and God said, okay, well now, now you can do it. It wasn't a special magical action. It was the fact that he believed in a way that he was willing to do anything God asked. If he believed in God but wasn't willing to follow him, then he really wouldn't be believing that God is who he says he is. Rahab the prostitute from the story of Jericho is very much the same. Some guys from uh, Israel sneak into Jericho. They're trying to scope the place out because this is part of a battle they have to win. And she hides them in her house. And even though the city's looking for them and they know they're there, she hides them, protects them, and then helps them get out of the city. But when they're having a conversation, she says this about God. Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know the Lord has given you this land. The Lord your God is God in heaven, above, heaven above, and on earth below. You see, she believed that God was who he says he was. He didn't, she didn't just hide them and God was like, you know, I know you don't believe in who I am, but I'm going to count you as a cool person anyway because you did me a favor. No, Rahab did these things. She hid these guys and put herself at risk because she believed that God was more powerful and more valuable than her safety from her own country. She believed that following God was worth the danger. She believed that this God was going to do exactly what he said. And it was that type of faith that God saw in her 
that caused her to do these actions, to do what he wanted and to do something for his glory. So Abraham is using these Old Testament stories, stories that were put down very specifically to show us how our faith in Jesus would save us, make us count it as righteous, and then cause us to do good works. See, if we don't believe that Jesus is who He says He is, then we're not going to follow Him. And if we don't believe that He actually did what He says He did, as in lived a perfect life, had no sin, was killed and then raised on the third day and defeated death, then we don't really have faith in Him. If we have that faith in Him, if we believe what He actually says, then that's going to be the type of faith that will make us want to change and want to do something about it and tell someone else and live differently. These stories that Abraham, that, that James is quoting directly about Abraham and Rahab are showing us how our faith leads us to action and how faith in Jesus can save us. He's not making up this new thing about Jesus because he wants to be true. He's saying, look, it's been this way for hundreds or even thousands of years. This is the way that God has always dealt with us. He gave us stories to let us know who Jesus was going to be and how we should live because of it. Finally, James 3.18, we see that James quotes several different types of Old Testament literature. In James 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 18, he says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. James has just talked all in chapter 3 about how you need to control your tongue about how you can tell whether or not you have maturity by whether or not you can control your mouth and what you're saying and what you're talking about. Then he talks about wisdom, about how if you're mature, you will also have wisdom. And he's summing up this whole idea of faith in action and maturity and wisdom by saying that the fruit of righteousness is peace. That if you are a mature person who is really acting on your faith, you will cause peace to be everywhere around you. That you're not going to be the type of person who doesn't control what they say and stirs up a whole bunch of trouble for everyone. James is referring specifically to numerous times in the Old Testament where we talk about people who bring peace. The first is Proverbs. Proverbs 11, verse 8, The righteous one is rescued from trouble. In his place, the wicked goes in. So, the righteous one would be the one who has faith and is acting on it. The wicked one would be the person who has no faith and can't control their mouth. With his mouth, just like James has been talking about, the ungodly destroys his neighbor. But through the knowledge, the righteous are rescued. Through that faith, through understanding who God is. It doesn't mean knowledge is just like, oh, they read a bunch of books and now they're saved. No, the knowledge there is very specifically the knowledge of who God is. He's saying, on the other side, with his mouth, the ungodly destroys his neighbor. This is the person that James is describing that has no faith. I'd like to stop right here for some personal application. It can be very difficult in our time to want to take a stand for morality. Often we use snarky ways, we use terrible language, we use derisive terms, and we make fun of people to say, look at you, you don't believe in Christianity. Social media has been horrible for that. We do not want to be like the ungodly who destroys his neighbor with his mouth. You need to speak. Sometimes you have to tell people that something is a sin, but you're not looking to destroy them. You are looking to have them turn to God. You want to speak even warnings to someone in love. We normally just stick with methods here, but that one bears special mentioning because we want to make sure that we're not falling off into becoming like the ungodly person. But all of this chapter, all of James is about you need the faith to change you so you can live this way. 
even wisdom, even just good practices are brought in about us by Jesus. It's our faith and that desire to please Him and knowing what He did for us causing that love that can help us be the righteous person that the Proverbs talk about. The one who through the knowledge of who Jesus is, is rescued and righteous. But he doesn't finish here with just Proverbs. He's also referencing peace from Isaiah. In Isaiah 32, 17, it says, The result of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quiet confidence forever. That when God's kingdom comes, because that's what Isaiah is talking about, when Jesus comes to the earth and shows us what God's kingdom is about, that the result will be peace. And that doesn't just mean we're not having wars on earth, because the Bible says there's always going to be wars on earth. This is very specifically referring to peace with God. There is no more anger between God and you because you have been forgiven. All the sins that you had to be punished for, that wrath that you had stored up for yourself, that is wiped away. God's not just still irritated with you but letting it slide. God loves you 100% as if you had done nothing wrong when you put your faith in Jesus and you trade places with Him. So Isaiah is giving us a different definition of peace. And he also says it's a quiet confidence. The unshakable belief that describes the type of faith that we're seeing in James. So we see from James quoting Isaiah here that we are seeing what type of people we will be when we are part of the kingdom, when we believe in Jesus. But he's not done. He is also referencing Hosea 10, 12 here as well. It says, sow righteousness for yourselves and reap faithful love. Break up your unplowed ground. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and sends righteousness on you like rain. Now, James is talking about the fruit of righteousness. Hosea is talking about sowing righteousness. And this is that Old Testament to New Testament fulfillment idea that we're talking about. In the Old Testament, the prophets are saying we need to sow the righteousness of God. We need to tell the world who He is. Now that Jesus has come, just with the seed metaphor, the agricultural here, that plant has given birth and the fruit of righteousness is your repentance. The fruit of righteousness is your salvation. We need to be breaking up the unplowed ground. Just like James is saying, if you believe in Jesus, you're going to act like it and tell someone else. Hosea is telling them it is time to seek the Lord until He comes. You need to be going out and saying, what does God have for me? How do I live in His will? How do I break this new ground and tell someone else about Him? Guys, we are just three of five chapters into James, and you can see that there is constant use of Old Testament allusions, quotations, typologies, prophecies, They use the Old Testament to show us that God has always been trying to tell us who Jesus is going to be or who Jesus is, how faith in Jesus will save us, how faith in Jesus will change our lives. When we understand how the Old Testament and the New Testament work together, we see that the Bible tells one great big story a story of a Savior who came and now we can live in peace with God because of that. I don't want to do this whole book for you. If you're studying this with your D group or your connect group, you guys can use that center column right there and go back and see how many Old Testament quotations and allusions that you can find. How many prophecies can you find just in a small book of James that Jesus fulfilled? Actually, if you want to take those and put them down in the comments, any that I haven't gone over, go ahead and comment those. Show me how you guys are using these principles to get more learning, to know more about who Jesus is out of your Bible time. Well, that's what we have for you today, and that concludes our study in the book of James. 
For online Catalyst, we will have more and more of these videos available. We'll be having different books coming up. So stay tuned, make sure you like and subscribe to this YouTube channel, or if you're watching us on Facebook, go ahead and click the like button and give us a share. We want to make sure these resources are available for D groups, connect groups, for friends, for family, any way you guys want to use these to study the Bible, we would love to help you out. If you have some ideas of the next book you'd like us to go over, the next book you'd like to study together, go ahead and put those in the comments as well. We hope to see you in the future in Online Catalyst. Thank you so much for being here, and remember, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Bible, everything all makes sense with Jesus in the middle of it.